First of all, thank you so much to Q for bringing me here. Um, of course, I am absolutely ecstatic to be in the great state of California with all of you amazing educators and to be spending St. Patrick's Day, happy St. Patrick's Day, with everyone here. But I got the great opportunity to leave 19 degree temperature to come here from Detroit, Michigan. And I love how full of hospitality everyone is. They're like, we're so sorry that it is a little bit chilly here. I'm like, are you kidding me? It feels amazing. So first of all, Jasmine, that was phenomenal, the talk that you gave. I Let's give it up for her. And congratulations also to Kristen and Michael. Fantastic job, just inspiring those around you and most importantly, the kids that we teach every single day. So I am Erin Klein from Detroit, Michigan, and I am here today to talk to you about three main things. So you have had the opportunity to be at a beautiful conference filled with inspiring people sitting next to you that you've brought alongside you, that you've met here, keeping in mind the kids that we teach, learning from great companies, presenters, but I really want you to kind of take a deep breath and relax for the next 30 minutes and really just kind of have that moment to synthesize everything that you've learned to take in. We're gonna just kind of think about three small things that make a huge impact on teaching. So I originally went into teaching because of my kids, my Riley and my Jacob. Now we have four of a blended family, which is great with Caden and Colin as well. But it's the students that I teach and because of my own kids, which is why I went into teaching. Prior, I did interior design for a while and it was when Riley was born that I realized truly the magic of children and why I wanted to be a teacher, not just for summers off, even though I tell people teachers work more in the summer than they do during the school year. Case in point, we're all here on a Saturday, right? So you give it up for yourself. So my kids right here are my students, my babies, and we could not all be here for the full Q conference because I'm still a full-time teacher in the classroom. So while you were here learning with one another on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, I was with my students in my classroom and we were watching the Twitter feed and we watched some of the live streams and my kids were so excited. And they were beyond thrilled when they found out, oh my gosh, you get to meet the man who wrote the dot. So we've been talking about creativity all year. So we celebrated in the classroom. You can see our pictures. We were reading the books, Ish and Dot, and it was wonderful just to have that level of enthusiasm in the classroom with the kids. So even though I wasn't here physically, we were definitely here in Michigan. So these are my two babies, so you can meet them. And if you're wondering, those of you that might follow me a little bit more closely on social media, Erin, uh, I thought your kids were a little bit older than that. They are, they're in the front row here, Riley and Jacob. But those of you who are parents or teachers, you know how difficult it is to get a picture of a group of students, let alone just two, smiling at the same time. This is one of my favorite pictures without one of those kind of weird faces of one of my kids. So. This is Riley and Jacob, and I tease them, but this is a better picture of our family together now, the four of us, and truly the reason why I push through in everything I do in teaching is for the kids, because I know that every single child that I have in my classroom truly is someone else's entire world. And even if they don't have someone at home who is their entire world, they are my entire world. So you've met my family briefly. I'm gonna share with you a video of a family that I think when you watch it, you'll realize the importance of point number one that I'm gonna talk about. I said I'll mention three. The first is gonna be that of relationships. And there is not a video that I've seen yet to date that I think illustrates the power of a strong relationship better than this. So let's enjoy. Emmett Richner is three, going on four, and for no particular reason, he is driving with his eyes closed, which would not appear to be going particularly well. Fortunately, Emmett has a mentor. I got a bagger that fits on the back. Erling Kingdom is 89, going on 90. Like this. And this has been going on. <laughs> Ready, set, go! For nearly a year. 
Emmett's parents had to laugh. He blocked me out. The first time they saw their preschool racing a man who fought in the Second World War. I told you he was fast. I'm super fast. You want to play croquet? Which stick are you going to have? The man they'd wave to, but barely knew. Watch this, Irving. From the house. Oh, right through. Next door. Boom! They're together pretty much every day. Did you find a worm? Nope, it's a, it's a bug. Emmett first crossed into Erling's yard when he caught a glimpse See these yellow flowers? of his favorite food. These are going to be tomatoes. Every time he saw me out there, he would come running over. Erling, got any tomatoes? <laughs> Can you throw a baseball with me? Every day. Erling can't see so good. A new adventure. Oops. We saw Erling over working on this bike that looked like it was from you know, the 60s. <laughs> and I thought, there's no way he's going to get on this bike. <laughs> and he did. It took him a couple times to get on his bike. And I thought, am I going to have to call 911? Please don't fall over. Anika Richner wondered if so warm a friendship you want to play Star Wars with these? would survive the winter. One day I looked out the window and I took this picture because it was just so cute. He was snow blowing a path from his back door straight to our back door <laughs> so they could visit. Yep. You know what this is from? Mm -hmm. It's from Erling. Where's the fish pool? He likes to show him things and draw him pictures and explain. So I can learn about how fishing works. He's just taught him so much. Which is why those tears um, have been coming more often. We decided back uh, a month ago to, to move. Brian Richner says their growing family simply needs more space. I love him. It is the hardest part about moving. Yeah, it's tough. And change. It's tough. Is coming uh, for early, too. <laughs> yeah. When you think about it. Soon, he'll be 90, Yeah. his wife is ill, and just days ago, Erling's kids finally convinced him it's time to trade his house and yard for a senior apartment. Erling, come over here! Till moving trucks roll. I can hear ya. Goodbye. We'll have to wait. Put a washer on. This January-December friendship still has a bittersweet July. Just do it by hand slow first. Well, there's no replacement for Erling. You won't find a neighbor like him. So you put the washer on first? That's right. Sometimes, as teachers, I think so often we get caught up in what we have to teach and everything that gets put on our plate. Our plates are so full, and as teachers, we are so gracious. We, we take it all on, but yet we never take anything off of our plates. And that's going to be my challenge to you today, because less really is more. The three things I'm going to speak to you about, the first being relationships. We can talk about all of the amazing apps and websites and teaching and learning and curriculum and devices and gadgets. But until you really work with a child and until you really build that relationship, nothing else matters, because a child doesn't care how much you know until they know truly how much that you care. So when we think about building those relationships with kids and we think about relationships in general, I want you to think about what that means for you in your classroom community. Now I know some of you have elementary classrooms that might be smaller, some of you might be middle school or secondary where you have a lot more students on your caseload. Some of you at the district-wide administrative level and you have a tremendous amount of not only students but also teachers that you care for daily. But if we pause to think about some of the research and some of the small things that really do make a big cultural difference within a school like relationships, it really is clear that those schools and districts and companies and organizations that are flourishing are those that really have done it right in terms of building that positive culture of relationships. Forbes put out a study of the research that UCLA did in terms of people and how they care about each other and the importance that this has. And I'm going to really encourage you to think for a minute 
about those students who need our help the most in classrooms. And when we think about the students that might be a little bit lost or that might need our care a little bit, chances are they're probably the student that also needs lesson four of multiplying fractions. They're probably also the student that needs the tier two and tier three reading intervention. But have you ever just really stopped to pause, not to close the achievement gap, but to close the relationship gap? Because sometimes it might not be the relationship gap between teacher and student. It might be something more that's happening at home. And when we think about those kids that might fall through our cracks, I want it to be those kids that we remember from today and about building relationships and about closing that gap. I'm gonna ask for you to pause for just a moment and give a moment of silence for some of those students that unfortunately have fallen through the cracks and some that the world may never see their greatest, greatest potential. So when we think about what really matters most in schools, and when we think about building relationships, I recently read a Reader's Digest story that was put out by Chase's teacher and his mother. In this article, it was nothing about politics, nothing about policy, but it spoke volumes. In this article, it talked about Chase's teacher who refuses to let any child fall through the cracks because she understands the importance of building relationships, not only between teacher and student, but really importantly between student and student. One of the things that Chase's teacher did in this article that she called a love ninja story was that every week this particular elementary teacher would have her students write down on a sheet of paper who they want to sit with, who they nominate for being a good citizen, and the kids would get really excited about it. And when I started reading this article, I thought, wow, is this really a practice I agree with? So I'm thinking as I'm reading, and the more I got into the article, I realized Chase's teacher wasn't looking for someone who that the students thought would be a good citizen for that week or who they wanted to sit with. Chase's teacher was truly thinking about who was really popular last week and who was being shunned this week. Chase's teacher was thinking beyond who should we nominate for something, but more about which student is falling through the cracks and how can I close that relationship gap. So when we think about what really matters in classroom, yes, curriculum matters, yes, all of this technology integration matters, but at the end, when we think about when we retire, what do we really want students to remember about us and the impact that we have? If you haven't seen this full Kid President video, when you're drinking your green beer for St. Patrick's Day later, <laughs> definitely watch this. It's a fantastic full clip. We're gonna watch a segment of it, but think about the impact that teachers really do have on students, and you might not realize it until years or even decades later. We're here today because Ms. Flexer has been teaching for 41 years and she's retiring. So today we just want to surprise her with a room full of her former students and let her know how much we appreciate her. You always talked about whose class you were going to get next year and I got really excited that I was going to get her classroom. She cares about your life, not only like your school life, but she also cares about your like personal life. As you know, we're here today to honor Mrs. Flexer who you all know as your first grade teacher. She'll be here in just a minute. Good morning, everybody. Everything good? I'm sorry, Look at your first Come year staple. Oh, here, the red shirt. Oh, my God. Did you tell me she Oh, my God. I keep looking at him. Oh, my God. I keep... I don't... I, Y'all, I'm so embarrassed, I don't even... <laughs> Everyone has either prepared something to say to you or they've written you a letter. 
Oh my I God. I believe it was 1994 when I was in your class. You are always my favorite teacher. You also <laughs> have my little cousins here now. You wrote the sweetest letters in my poor cards. You were definitely one of the sweetest teachers I've ever had. I remember in first grade you pushed me and my sister to do so well. And I think that's what makes you like the great teacher that you are. I remember one particular one particular day in school, for some reason you asked me to sing a song or something, and you got really excited and you're like, oh my god, that's so wonderful. Go next door and sing it for them. <laughs> <laughs> so you had me walk around to I think two or three different classrooms singing this one song. But for the first time I didn't feel like I was awkward. I felt like something I could do was special. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. I was a timid little blonde, and your love for me gave me the confidence to grow into the woman I am today. You hold such a special place in my heart, and I will cherish the impact you've had on my life forever. So the work that we do really does have an impact forever. And you might not reach every single kid every single day, every single year, but think about when you truly build strong relationships, the impact that you will have. I'm gonna share a personal story about a man in our community who had an incredible impact on children. Two years ago, I was presenting in Texas and an email had come across our desk. Now, I have had the real fortune of working with who I would consider one of the absolute best assistant principals I've ever met. Beautiful teacher, beautiful woman, incredible heart and soul. And her name is Kai Robinson. And her husband, while he had never taught directly with us, is a retired teacher in the community and who would often substitute teach whenever we would need a substitute. And the kids loved Miles unconditionally. This is a man that as a teacher, when he comes in the room, sometimes you're like, yay, coffee break, because it's a little too intense to stay when he's in the room. You would come back and there's paper airplanes going and kids creating and doing, but the kids were learning. Next thing you know, I'd go in and they're talking about aerodynamics as they're throwing the airplanes and they're just like hugging him and clinging to every single word that he's saying. And the kids absolutely lit up around him as he inspired them to learn through fun and play. So two years ago, when I was presenting in Texas, I had received an email. And in that email, it brought me to tears instantly. And I was worried for my friend Kai and her dear husband. They're both extremely athletic. They compete in Ironmans together, extreme bicyclist. And so we're hanging on needle and thread just waiting to figure out if Miles, who was hit by an automobile, is gonna be okay. The follow-up email to that was that he had passed away. This is a man who had touched not only the students that he taught, but everyone in the entire district through meeting him and being able to just be in his presence of natural fun and curiosity. There wasn't a topic about education that I couldn't mention to him that he would just connect a million dots for me and say, yeah, well, Aaron, have you also heard about this? Or you should read this book. So when this happened, the community pulled together in extraordinary ways and raised money for him to help kind of not let his memory be lost. And in a matter of days, a significant amount was in fact raised just to show the love and appreciation for this educator. So never forget the impact that you have on kids and the difference that you make. One of the greatest things that Miles said was that the world really is his classroom. And Kai, in one of her closing remarks in an article in our local community, stated that she really wanted people to know how he let his students just continuously seek and be curious. And I think that that is extremely important when we start to think about what matters most to kids is their opinions, their thoughts, and their ideas. Because like I said at the beginning, every child in our classroom really is someone else's entire world. So that brings me to my second point that I wanna talk about. We know that relationships matter and building those strong connections, not only between ourselves and our students, but between students as well. But then when we think about how do we let students know that they matter, that relationships matter, yes, but their voice truly matters. 
So now we're gonna take just a kind of icebreaker moment because you've been sitting for a while and I'm an elementary teacher and I know that you need that blood flowing. So we're gonna do just a very brief activity and it's super fun. We do this in our classroom. You can differentiate it for the grade level that you teach, bless you. We could do um, multiplication facts, a lot of different things. But when I say proceed, what you're going to do is you'll stand up to the person who's sitting next to you. You're just gonna go back to back. And then once I see everyone is back to back, I'll give you further instructions. Instructions. So on your feet, you may proceed. <laughs> All right, and now that we are back to back, I have my students do this so that the volume also goes down. Now you're with a partnership and you're going to, with your five fingers, select one finger, do not show your partner, that's why you're back to back. So maybe hold up a one, a two, a three, a four, or a five. Okay, not a, not a zero. Let's either do one, two, three, four, or five. If you're doing multiplication, you wouldn't want to use a one. Let them pick two, three, four, or five. But when I say go, you and your partner are going to quickly turn around. You're going to come up with the sum of the two digits that you're holding up. So if your partner has a three and you have a two, the first one to say five would win. Regardless if you win or lose, high five your partner because the activity is fun for the learning experience. Immediately go back to back. We're gonna do best two out of three. Get your fingers ready and go. All right, high five and back to back. Get your fingers ready. And remember you have two out of three, so you still have a chance. Ready? Go. <laughs> High five those partners. For some of you, this might be a tie breaker. All right, get those digits ready. And this time, I'm gonna switch it up. We are gonna do multiplication. Ooh, all right, get your fingers ready. And go. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Give yourselves a round of applause and have a seat. All right, we do that activity in our classroom. Sometimes those awkward moments whenever you have um, an assembly to go to and they're not quite ready for you to proceed in and you're trying to keep your entire line of students really quiet, we do that game in a whisper voice because it's just an opportunity to kind of fill some time. Our kids love starting the day, but what I love about that short, simple, and easy idea is that you can do it anywhere, anytime with many different topics. And I love seeing the kids smile. And as I was watching, John pulls his phone out, he's videotaping. There wasn't a single person in here who wasn't like laughing and having a good time. I love when you can get a big bang for a small buck and get a lot of laughter out of kids. So, that is a great idea that we do in our classroom quite often. Big ideas and big differences from very small things, high impact. So the student voice really matters. When you build relationships in classrooms, you've got a solid foundation, a lot of trust. You can get kids to take more risks and you can really celebrate that. But if you don't have kids who are ready to feel their voice that it truly matters, then there's still some work that needs to be done. Newsweek did a study on the creativity crisis, and it was, you know, are kids no longer curious once they reach middle school and high school, or is it that our school systems and our culture and society has kind of schooled them out of that? Case in point, when I went from first grade, kids ask questions all the time. Once I got to middle school, they were just silent. The questions were, when is this due? Can we pick our partner? Is this for a grade? So when we think about the types of curious questions we really want our students to be asking, I wanna share my process with you. So I started teaching in first grade and then I went to middle school. In my middle school classroom, I asked my kids, what is it that you guys are interested in reading? I read a great book by Rafe um, Esquith, who was former Disney Teacher of the Year, phenomenal guy. If you haven't read There Are No Shortcuts, great, great, very quick read. 
but it goes into eff talking about the effort and grit and perseverance. And he had his kids read great classical literature. And I wanted to take this practice into my own classroom. So I thought I wanted to read Wuthering Heights with my middle school kids, um, seventh and eighth graders. And I asked them, what are you interested in reading about? And at the time, many years ago, Twilight was all the rave. And we were team Edward. In fact, I named my cat Edward. So, but I asked my kids, hmm, if we're going to read, you know, these vampire books, what is it that we can kind of study alongside it? And we started reading Wuthering Heights. The kids drew such amazing parallels to the characters. We dug deeper in literacy that year than I ever thought possible, the work that these kids did. I asked them, what's the next book that you want to read? For those of you that have read this, you're probably thinking in your heads, rightfully so, what in the world did she read that book with her students for? Well, I knew my kids because I had that relationship with them, and I wouldn't do it with the demographic where I am now, but for these students, this was absolutely the right choice. In fact, one of the little boys that recommended it, I knew that there was a reason for it. And I asked, you know, why is it that you want to read this story? He shared some really insightful information, which was heartbreaking, but he also said it was the first book that he ever saw his mom read and that she'd never put down. I knew that my class, once I said, I don't know if we can read this, they were all gonna read it anyway. So whether it was gonna be with teacher guidance, Okay, or independent, I'd rather them read it together with me. This book is from a personal narrative about a boy who was in fact abused um, by his mother. This book single-handedly built our classroom community so incredibly strong. Within six weeks, I can't even begin to tell you the impact and difference it made. My students were so empowered to go beyond the classroom and make a difference and wanted to know, what can we do? We want their voice to be heard. How can we allow our voice to be heard to help them? And it was just remarkable. I had students who wanted to volunteer after school who told me about battered women and children shelters in my own community that I didn't even know existed. We started volunteering at the Catherine Cobb Center in Adrian, Michigan. And I had students that I just thought would sign up on occasion, but I couldn't keep up with the demand of students that wanted to volunteer. We ended up doing an entire year-long program where we did a lot with making uh, Valentine's cards for the children. We did Easter egg hunts with them and we built relationships with those kids who needed it while their mothers would go and learn skill sets on how to job interview and how to build resumes so that they could be successful in their lives for themselves and their children and their families. So the impact that my kids had just from reading this book together was incredible. When we think about the power of voice, you can see it very clearly in this video where the moment that this young boy hears his mother's voice for the absolute first time is absolutely life-changing. Recording, Lachlan. First, His hearing. first hearing aid. With sound. Hello, darling. Oh, my God. Hello, Lachlan. There we go. Well, hello. Oh, darling. Oh, darling. Oh. Hi. Hello. 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 Hi. Oh, no. Hi. 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 Hi when his life was forever changed. So the more I started studying and thinking, okay, I'm doing all these great things for my students, but now it kind of brought me back to that mom moment and I thought, well, was I even listening to my own two students who were my inspiration for going into teaching in the first place? So I decided that very day that I had that moment, that idea, to go home and ask my daughter, Riley, Riley, if you could do anything, what do you want to do? And she said, mommy, I want to start a blog just like you. And I was like, really? Like, okay, well, let's do it. So she started a blog and just sharing her everyday ideas. And then she said, well, mom, how can I let my voice be heard? She said, I need to get Instagram and Pinterest and Google Plus and LinkedIn. And I said, oh my gosh, how old are you? And part of me thought, hmm, is this her ploy to just get social media or did she really want to start a blog? But she was sharing her ideas with the world and she was learning from other people who she was following as well. 
So then I asked my son, who at the time was very young, and I said, Jacob, if you could do anything, what would you do? And he's like, oh, I'm already doing it. I was like, of course you are, because you're like three and a half. So, Jacob, what is it? What are you doing? He goes, oh, I, I make YouTube videos. And I was like, uh, you think you make YouTube videos? And he's like, no, Mom, they're all on your phone. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> he's like, yeah, just look. So this is Jacob's video. When we got back from Shed's Aquarium in Chicago, this is one of the videos that he shared with me on my very own phone. This is an art aquarium. If you go it, you might see some beluga whales and people sitting in the chairs. And when you do, it's going to be a lot cool. The whole video is like seven minutes where he kind of goes on and on and on. But I was like, I've got the coolest kid ever. Not only did he make a super cute video, but he's got the audience. His little stuffed animals, Creeper from Minecraft, is sitting on Lego blocks. I'm like, you are so cool. So I started to think, great, my kids are now kind of exploring their ideas and sharing. How can I bring this level of authenticity to my own classroom so that they can be inspired to be creative as well? Well, I had gotten back from an ed camp, which is a phenomenal professional learning opportunity if you haven't been to one, and I was telling my kids about it, and their immediate response was, when can we do one? And I said, you wanna go to a teacher ed camp on a Saturday? And they said, no, no, we wanna do that here. And I said, oh, that's a great idea, let's do it Friday. So hence, ClassCon was born. My students wanted their voice to be heard, and they said, you know what, we're experts in stuff, plenty of stuff we can share with our friends. So just really quick and easy, I had my kids sign up for rotating 15 minute sessions where they could teach their friends about a topic that they were experts in. And it took no time out of our schedule except for an hour on Friday because they already knew a lot that they had to share. But the extreme amount of learning that came out of this was just unparalleled to anything I had ever done that only lasted an hour in our classroom. Milani had brought in Indian food and shared her culture and heritage with our class, who we didn't know a lot about at the time. When I stopped by her session and asked her about it, I was like, Milani, this is phenomenal. Like, I'm learning so much. And I was like, and the food is great. What was your favorite part about doing all of this? And she was like, well, I just loved cooking with my mom. How fabulous is that? also just creating those moments for your students as well. Then we had so many kids come in. Cooper brought in his snowboard and he was definitely the cool athlete of the day. You can see all the kids in back totally celebrating his awesomeness, which was wonderful to see. And love Michael's project. I think mom might have helped a little bit, but it was really, really great. He came in with a full presentation board and everything. He could pronounce all the dinosaur names I couldn't even pronounce, and the kids loved learning about his passion. We had so many kids. Emiliano brought in chess, and he said, you know what? Being in Michigan, we have a lot of indoor recess, so I want my friends to know how to play chess so that I now have a partner to be able to enjoy that with. We had kids who taught just everything. We had origami books. We had Reem, who brought in her Arabic book and taught just basic words and phrases. Gasper just taught about trucks. His family owns a scrapyard. I mean, the kids had the time of their life with this day. Paul got to share about his dad was from Australia. He brought in tons of artifacts and got to share about that area. And it was just so incredible to hear these kids be the teachers for that day. So this is now a tradition that we do in our classroom each year, and the kids get to do it often throughout the year, and it's something that's kind of spread as well. I love hearing feedback from teachers who've kind of adopted this. My favorite example is Ellie, who she had made her little poster board and violin, and when the kids came in from one of their specials, I noticed that poor Ellie's violin was in the middle of the floor, and it was about to get stepped on. I was like, oh, Ellie, go grab your violin. And she goes running over to the reading area, and she picks up her poster board and very carefully moves it over and I was like, Ellie, your violin. She cared so much about her poster board that she created because this meant something to her. It created an authentic learning experience where her voice could be heard and she could share about what she was an expert in. Brooke made little Ziploc baggies filled with needlepoint so that the kids could experiment and try. And I'm thinking like, how great for even fine motor. So though I had been teaching for a number of years, you know, we're never too late to kind of try something new. We're never quite done, right? Imagine of all the inventions if we did say, oh no, we're good enough, we're done. So when you think about your experiences from school, I bet your most important ones that really hold a special place in your heart are probably from a teacher or a friend or a coach, someone that had a strong relationship with you, 
someone that allowed your voice to be heard as a student, not a particular lesson that was taught for a day, but more important, the life lesson. So when we think about how we can create these moments of opportunity, I'm going to share one last point with you, and that is one that kind of brings me back to my former passion and career of interior design and kind of how I've molded that into making a big impact in a small way of doing small changes in our classroom and some things that you can do as well. So in our classroom, we have ditched the desks in 2012, went to a completely flexible seating learning environment, but not just because we wanted to have a Pinterest pretty classroom, but because we no longer wanted our classroom to look in a way that didn't really mirror the way that we were learning, nor the way that I was teaching or the way that they were teaching one another. So when we started thinking about how we could make a big impact in our classroom, one of my favorite quotes, anyone know who said this? If we teach today's students like we taught yesterday as we rob them of tomorrow, yay, yes. So John Dewey said that, and he actually said it in 1915. So it's not a recent quote, but 100% relevant. So I started researching with my students what would make the biggest impact for them in their classroom. Would it be you know, the flipped classroom model? Would it be Kagan cooperative learning structures? Would it be you know, something new initiative like Common Core or Google's 80-20% that we adopted, Genius Hour? What would it be? And it just seemed like the more we kept researching, the more learning experiences of PD, professional learning that I went to, I was becoming overwhelmed. And I had to take a step back, which is what I asked you to do at the beginning today, and ask yourself, how can I do a little bit less to make a lot bigger impact so that we don't end up feeling like this? Oh, well, let's see. I guess one of the things that's really bothering me are all these concepts and trends and theories. I mean, they keep swimming around in my head like tiny little fishies. It's all right brain this and learning styles that. Do you know what I'm supposed to do? I'm supposed to be able to teach a left-headed right-brained ENFP number three learner with spatial intelligence in a sunny classroom at 2 p.m. on a Friday in May. <laughs> Times that by 180 and you've got my life in a nutshell. <laughs> I was like, yes, she gets it. So the more I just kept putting on my plate and the more you are going to come away from this conference because you have learned so much. Q is like one of the absolute best, highest quality conferences. And I know you're going to come back with a just overwhelming amount that you want to take back to your students. But when we think about really what matters most, I want to encourage you to think about, you know, yes, incorporating all of the wonderful things you've learned, but keeping the foundations at heart. And one of those foundations that I think matters a lot that often gets overlooked is that of the learning environment. Because no matter what we learn and no matter what we want to incorporate into our classrooms, if we continue to have traditional teaching environments, we can only continue to teach in a traditional way. I used to beg my kids, turn eye to eye, knee to knee, let's collaborate, let's talk. And it just wasn't happening until 2012 when I had one single goal in mind. I wanted to start small so that I can make a big difference. And together with talking to my students, because there's only one of me in a room full of them, I asked, what do you think would make the biggest difference if we could redesign our learning space? And they wanted to be comfortable. So I asked, well, what does that mean for a second grader? To be comfortable, what is it that you want? And after kind of studying their behaviors and having discussions in class meetings, they wanted to just spread out, have room for their materials. They wanted to be comfortable to be able to lay down if they wanted, to be able to put their feet in their seat if they wanted, to be able to sit with a partner or a small group without having to move furniture all around. And I said, you guys sound just like me and my professional colleagues. Like this. Why hasn't it made more sense in years prior? And I was really disappointed with myself being an interior design background that I hadn't done anything sooner. So we decided to ditch the desks. And by day two, I had tears and wondering, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? This is a big mess. But then by day three, things started to get a little bit better. And then day four, I was still a little overwhelmed. I actually did bring in sleeping bags for the kids. And they camped out for a little bit as we worked all hours of the night to try and transform our classroom into a suitable space for the students. 
finally day five, there was light at the end of the tunnel, and then ultimately a learning experience that my students could enjoy, where there was room for them to spread out and work around the room, and it was such a difference maker, a game changer in our classroom. They now had creative areas where they can come together in small groups or partnerships, and when I was a little bit nervous, and my administrator was a lot bit nervous and said, you know, Klein, we're not endless here and funding, so this furniture isn't as durable as all the others, and I was like hoping and praying that my students would be respectful with the items that we had gotten grant money for and raised to kind of put in the classroom. This table is $239 Walmart online, and after five years, it's still in impeccable condition, still being used, and I remember asking my kids, guys, you are so respectful with this furniture and everything that we have in our classroom. I am so proud of you, but I have to ask, like, how is this happening? Why? And one of the little guys in my classroom, I'll never forget, he said, oh, so do you know when you go to a really, you know, I don't know, like fun restaurant, like McDonald's, you can run around and play and be crazy. But then when mom or dad takes you to a really nice restaurant, like Applebee's, and I started laughing, he goes, then you know you have to behave. And I was like, yes, my classroom is Applebee's. That's what I always wanted. So. But it's straight from the mouths of babes. But these are straight from our kids of what they have been really wanting. So when we think to the research, it proves and indicates this as well. Carnegie Mellon has done a lot of research. Susan Kavalik has done a lot of highly effective teaching. Lots of books and articles out there. But it boils down to thinking how the brain learns and the brain research. And when you get environments that are, you know, not Pinterest pretty pink polka dots, but really gender neutral where both can enjoy. When you get environments that really speak to what little boys might like and what little girls might like. And when you get environments where everyone feels comfortable and everything is at eye level, no one wants to go to the movie theaters and sit front row. So when we think about not laminating so that there's big glares on things, bringing items that we want children to be able to access at their eye level and fingertips, it really shows that we have respect for them as learners of the space because ultimately, when I did at interior design, the first thing you do is always contact your client to find out their wants and needs. But yet in education, we never do that. We take a step back and we think we know what our clients, our students need, but yet their voice is often silenced. So when we think about what matters most to them and thinking about what makes a big difference, I encourage you to get your students involved and find out what is it that they want to be able to do. And also considering the research that has been put out on students with learning differences. Carnegie Mellon has done a lot about attention to allocation in terms of design for students. And when we think about what is put on the walls, making it really not look like a teacher store exploded. So I think, you know, sometimes we can get a little overwhelmed. I know I can, especially when you get a couple extra gift cards, maybe around the holidays, and you go to the teacher store to buy some things. Really just kind of keeping in mind not permanently putting up permanent wallpaper around your room, but being cognizant of all the students, building those relationships, letting them know that their voice matters, and designing a learning environment ultimately that shows that they are valued. In closing, I want to mention something that I am doing this year with my team in fourth grade, and this is something that we've never done before. We have literally decided to kind of take everything we've ever done before and throw it out the window and start new with our students. We are integrating reading, writing, and every content area, including working with specialists across the board at our school, and thinking about what can we do to design really creative learning spaces and learning opportunities for students. When I saw this image of a tour bus in New York, I instantly got the idea, this is genius. For years, tour bus companies have been putting um, their consumers, their customers, in staggered rows, one behind the other, to where when you're on a tour of a city, you see hardly anything if you're on the center because you're automatically encountered with an obstructed view. When this company decided to kind of flip things upside down and disrupt the industry, they're now the number one tour bus company in New York. They not only have redesigned their buses in a creative and innovative way, but now, because everyone has a front row seat, they can create interactive experiences for their visitors on their tour bus as well throughout the city as the tour is going on. I thought this was incredibly genius. And I told this to my students and I said, just by redesigning the physical space of something, 
How can we make a big impact in our classroom? So in fourth grade, we decided, let's bring our kids down and be disruptive in our town in Detroit and find out what is really happening as we go from kind of revitalizing Detroit. If you haven't heard, it's an amazing place now, making an extreme comeback. Detroit is really, really doing a phenomenal job in terms of innovation, being what I would consider really, really great for entrepreneurialism. And our kids went down there and they talked with thought leaders, business makers, entrepreneurs, and they got ideas from the industry of what was happening in Detroit and how they were inspiring this change. They got to find out what these city leaders and officials and business makers were doing and then after they learned about all of this, they got to compare it what Detroit was back in the automotive time and then kind of the history of what happened and how it's making a comeback. And when we got back to our classroom, our students said, how can we kind of shake things up in our classroom? So they got to work. Our students said, we need to make a change in our classroom. They immediately started thinking, how can we even change our learning environment? So they got together with some ideas and then we took them down to Detroit again and said, let's visit some interior design firms. How are they creating workspaces for today's entrepreneurs and how are they considering this? Our students got to learn firsthand from space planning perspective, thinking about everything that goes in hand to all of this. Our students came back well informed and inspired and hit the ground running. So then what we decided is now that we have these incredible spaces that are being transformed in all of fourth grade, what is that next step or that next layer? And that's where we've decided to kind of take that design thinking approach and really stop teaching social studies, reading, writing, and isolation, but combining it all. We've taught regions for years in fourth grade. We said, what if we teach regions through a different lens? What if we have students investigate real problems in the world and then think about where are these problems happening and then get passionate about a difference that they can make go through the design thinking process of what they can do through research of reading nonfiction expository, through writing articles about the research in our writing workshop, then writing persuasive pieces after we learn about persuasive writing, finding out who lobbyists are, who legislators are in those areas to try and make an impact to help for these regional problems that they're now passionate about. And it's made the biggest difference in terms of natural engagement in our classroom. We bring them to the Science Institute and let them research and study. We bring in specialists. We use all the great technology and gadgets that you've got to learn about, but now in authentic ways in our classroom through all of these design thinking processes. Um, a huge company in Michigan is Imagine Theaters. They have really disrupted the industry in terms of theater. And my four kids who are here today are a testament to this because even as much as I love them, they can dig their heels in a little bit. They refuse to go to any other movie theater unless it's Imagine, because the experience is totally different. It's just like eating popcorn in your own living room, but with a whole theater full of people. So Imagine has done a great job with this, and space really, really does matter. We know, Kane's Arcade, prime example, when you give kids that creative space to be able to create, they will absolutely rise to the occasion. So I want you to always keep that in the forefront of everything that you do and provide that opportunity. My last video as I let John come up here to do his closing is to give you just the final update on Emmett and to find out how the two boys are doing in their relationship. Emmett's old backyard is empty. Oh, I see some now. As Erling Kingdom picks the tomatoes. Yeah. He planted last spring with his body. Yes. Kind of lonely out here. Sometimes, you know. Fortunately. Off we go. <laughs> the prescription well, for lonely yeah. is just 16 miles away. When Erling comes, do you know what he's going to bring? Maybe a big tomato. <laughs> There's that little tyke. It's like no time has gone by. What is this? They didn't miss a beat. What is this? Wait a minute, don't break them. First Erling and Emmett play date is on. Oh, this is real neat, Emmett. Look at this. Oh, you've got a nice view. Pretty soon the farmer's going to come. 
I'm going to cut one that corn down. we got to feed the animals. One with so much to teach. Why do you expect cows kind of slow? The other, hungry to learn. There's a battery. Why do you need, um, like, batteries for your, your ear motor? Is it any wonder on moving day neither wanted to let go? It was good weather. Yeah. You know. A few days from now, it is an over early. Okay. We'll so be moving to. We'll see you guys. <laughs> so keep in mind those three really small things that can have such a profound impact as you take everything you've learned here at Q today back to your own classrooms, your own buildings, your own districts, that relationships matter, giving students that real authentic voice so that true learning and teaching can transpire in an environment that really shows kids that they matter in a space that makes a big, big difference for them. So thank you guys so much for having me out, especially on St. Patrick's Day on a Saturday. I appreciate it so very much. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>